Okay, so uh, we, before we start, uh, I'll just again uh, one small de digression. So again, I was thinking about the cooling of the earth uh, since yesterday. And I thought, uh, I mean, another possible model is just that it's, of course, radiating and it's getting some heat from the sun, right? So, I mean, uh, if you just write a simple equation, uh, uh, so it's loose, so then, I mean, you can think, if you think a bit, it's clear that you'll have some equation like this. Uh, Okay, so this is some constant alpha. Okay, so basically, I mean, uh, it's uh, the Earth has some uh, specific heat and all that, and it's uh, so it's losing energy. Uh, so this must be the rate of loss of energy, right? There's some specific heat and all that, and then there's some sigma t4 loss, and then the, but it's also getting heat from the sun, right? So it, this is coming from the sun. So you have to, I mean, so if you write uh, the uh, simplify equations, you'll get some constant out here, but this is the equation you get, right? And <clears throat> from this equation, what you know is that in the steady state, uh, you, you can compute what is the steady state temperature of the Earth. And actually, quite amazingly, you'll find that if you put the sun's temperature as 6,000, uh, this number will be something like uh, 280 Kelvin. Okay, so it, it's just, uh, it just works out. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's like that. Now, you can ask uh, how long does it take to uh, get to this temperature, right, starting from 6,000. So this is the rate at which the Earth is cooling. And how long does it take? Okay, so can anyone say how long, like, uh, how long does it take to reach this? If I solve this equation? Okay, so of course you have to just take uh, dt by uh, t4 minus ts4. And you start from, let's say, 6,000, and you go down to TSS. Alpha time. Right, that's the, yeah, okay. So, I mean, last night I was doing this, okay, and uh, it was very late in the night, and I didn't want to do this integral, so I just put it in Mathematica, okay. And uh, Mathematica gave me a number, so this is like 282 or whatever. Okay, and Mathematica gave me a number, okay, so it gave me some uh, some value, okay. And then I uh, calculated the time, and I got uh, 50 million years. OK, and then uh, in the morning, I was thinking a bit about the integral. And then I thought, this, this is, of course, divergent, right? I mean, this is a, I mean, because there's a t minus uh, TSS singularity, there's a logarithmic divergence at uh, when you uh, reach this. So this is actually infinite, OK. So this is, I mean, I just wanted to say that if you do, uh, so like, uh, at least I don't know if there's a bug in my uh, Mathematica uh, program, but it's a serious problem. I mean, uh, uh, if you just use math, so you should be careful while using Mathematica. That's what I just wanted to say. <laughs> I mean, uh, this is a very simple integral, right? It doesn't warn you that there's a problem. It just gives, gives you an answer and you get a completely, uh, yeah, so if Fourier was uh, doing this computation and he would have said this is the answer. But it's actually, I mean, you can't get it, uh, this is just close up, so you don't get a time scale. So you have to do some other thinking. <laughs> okay, anyway, so that's um, uh, degradation. So we go get back to the question of, so yesterday what we discussed is, uh, uh, we looked at this mechanical model of uh, particles uh, in uh, moving on the line. And uh, so this, uh, okay, I'll use a different notation today. Maybe I'll just call them x1, p1, and so on. Okay, yesterday I called them x, uh, so x, k. Uh, so these are n particles, and then there's some Hamiltonian. There's some external potential for each particle, and then there's nearest neighbor interactions. Uh, okay, so, and then we said uh, we uh, connect these particles to Langevin baths, and uh, so the, uh, I mean, uh, so you wrote some uh, Langevin dynamics for the system, 
And uh, then the, uh, we say that, uh, uh, okay, so, and uh, so the dynamics is basically, uh, so P1 dot, Okay, and uh, the noise uh, for the first guy Okay, and then given the system, uh, the sort of equations we can evolve it, and we know we'll reach a, uh, eventually we'll reach a steady state, uh, and uh, we can. Okay, so we can of course also ask how does it reach a steady state? But uh, in the steady state, uh, so you can compute things, and uh, so we said that we'll define uh, local temperature at uh, at uh, different sites as uh, T K equals to. And uh, so this is how we'll define the temperature at a different sites in the system. And then we said that uh, we can also find the current. Uh, uh, so the current uh, operator is given by, uh, let's say, uh, the velocity of a particle. Uh, so let's say Vk. And then the force uh, that uh, the k minus 1 particle exerts on the kth particle. Okay. So the expectation of this object will give the average current. Okay. And uh, then in the tutorial, we showed that uh, uh, since uh, there's a, we could, uh, uh, so this Hamiltonian, we said we can write it as uh, sum over epsilon k. And that defines the local energy at uh, each point. And then that's how we got the current operator. So we say del epsilon k by del dt is equal to uh, uh, current flowing into this uh, into site uh, k from k minus one uh, minus current flowing out. Right. And uh, then we say that if you take a uh, average of this. It's a time derivative, so a time uh, average of a time derivative is zero in the steady state, and so that shows that current on every bond is equal. Okay, so we must have because current is conserved, so at every bond it's equal, and you can ask what is uh, what is the current flowing from the reservoir into the system? Uh, so then you should look at the first particle. Okay, so if you look at the first particle, this energy is given by epsilon one equals to. Uh, Okay, so let's say zero is uh, zero for, for for the moment. Okay, so I don't put a half here because there's nothing, uh, no other particle to share the energy, right? So all the energy must be in this U for the last particle. So if you do again this epsilon one dot uh, business, uh, what you'll find is you'll get, uh, so just use the equations of motion and so on, and you'll find that this equals to uh, J of uh, uh, okay, so you'll find that it is J of L1 minus, okay, so uh, J, J2 is the same object uh, that we defined here. So it's the current flowing into the uh, second site and uh, uh, J, JL, 
uh, has the following expression. So J L is equal to uh, okay, so average is equal to um, so so w w I mean if you it, what should what do you expect right so basically you can th th this is the force from the reservoir on the first particle okay so again if it should just be force into velocity right so it should just be this into uh, velocity okay so this is the force uh, from the uh, heat reservoir uh, on the first particle oh, so let me just put velocity here v1 plus uh, v1 into velocity of the first side average okay so this is the heat flowing from the reservoir into the first particle and this is going to the second particle so this is the expression and this actually you can uh, write it in a slightly different uh, form so the first term is minus gamma uh, and v1 square is uh, we defined it as the local temperature of at the first side right so uh, this is just uh, t1 divided by m and uh, then this uh, z1 into v1, the noise into vel velocity average, this, uh, okay, so I won't show it, but you can show that this is uh, always equal to gamma by m into t left reservoir. Okay, so this is just a constant, the, uh, this average. Okay, this is this. So this is finally equal to uh, gamma by m. Okay. So the current is uh, basically depends on the difference in uh, first particle and left reservoir temperature. Okay, so this is, uh, 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 so this, okay, so this is what we want to compute now in the, uh, for various systems, we want to now uh, uh, compute these objects and then see if uh, Fourier's law is valid or not, okay. So, uh, Okay, so one of the, uh, I mean, uh, so uh, one of the important, and uh, like uh, most uh, obvious thing to check uh, for, uh, that should be true for Fourier's law is to see, uh, we said that uh, from Fourier's law, uh, if the temperature difference is small, then uh, this should be true, right? The, in, the steady, in a steady state where a small temperature difference is applied, the current should uh, scale with system size as one over L, okay? And in this case, let's say one over N. At least, I mean, we just always work with a fixed density of particles, so L and N are kind of proportional. So is this true? Okay, I mean, uh, that's one of the first questions. Uh, and then we want to look at other things like, uh, what is the temperature profile? I mean, do you get a linear temperature profile and so on? Okay, so uh, we have to put in some, uh, like, form of potential, uh, interaction potential and uh, uh, this here. Okay, so what is the simplest uh, uh, form of potential one can choose? Harmonic rate. So that's like in solid state physics, we always start with a harmonic uh, a crystal. And so, I mean, so the simplest thing is to try harmonic. Okay, so, uh, Okay, so uh, so harmonic crystal means uh, so let's say uh, okay so okay so this is some notice so, so this thing is something I'll call it a pinning potential okay and this is the interaction potential okay so this I mean uh, this term makes a big difference as we'll see afterwards uh, having this term. Okay, so initially let's put the pin, there's no pinning potential and let's just, uh, so V of uh, X, uh, so V of R equal to zero and U of R is equal to, uh, let's say, okay, so that's the interaction potential, that's the simplest model one can choose. Okay. So this problem was uh, studied by, uh, I mean, uh, so it's a very uh, sort of famous paper by, uh, Uh, 
uh, Ryder, Leibowitz, and Lieb in uh, 1967. And uh, uh, so they could actually uh, solve this problem exactly, OK? And uh, so what do you, uh, so I'll uh, discuss the solution later. Uh, I mean, how do you get an exact solution? What, what do you mean by exact solution? And uh, they could compute uh, both uh, the uh, current and the temperature profile exactly. Okay. Uh, with these two different uh, temperatures, okay. And what they found, okay. So this, uh, this uh, uh, formalism I'll describe uh, later, but I'll just state the results. Uh, so the results were. Uh, so what you find is that uh, so uh, I mean the. Uh, Okay, so first of all, uh, this uh, this uh, what does the current as a function of system size look like? So what they found is that uh, the current as a function of system size, I mean, at small system size there was some dependence, and but for large n it's completely independent of system size. Okay, so there's no one by n decay; it's just completely independent of system size, and the temperature profile. Uh, so x, uh, let's say zero to l. Uh, so at uh, this end you have some. T left and you have some T right here. And what you get is that uh, almost everywhere the temperature is uh, flat. It's equal to TL plus TR by 2. And at the, uh, at the, uh, at the end you have some funny uh, behavior. Maybe first particle is slightly here and then you have something like that. Uh, and similarly here, uh, there's some, okay, so there's an exponentially small boundary region where there's some temperature dependence, but in the bulk, it's completely flat. Okay, so there's a, uh, so the, you don't get a linear profile, and the current is independent of system size. So obviously, Fourier's law is not valid, right? I mean, this is, okay. So now, I mean, uh, this is, of course, not very surprising, right? I mean, because, so if we think of, like, uh, so how is heat carried in this uh, crystal? I mean, it's a, uh, uh, in crystals, I mean, like uh, solids, what we expect is phonons are carrying the heat. And uh, the, so phonons means, like, these are the uh, normal mode solutions of the harmonic crystal. And because here there's no scattering, so obviously you don't expect uh, uh, any uh, system size dependence, right? So if you excite a phonon at one end, it just goes ballistically. So that, that's why you don't expect any temperature uh, uh, size dependence. Okay, so uh, that's first the first thing. So then basically, how do you get uh, any uh, non-trivial uh, uh, effects is to, you have to have some, some mechanism to scatter phonons, right? So, uh, so then, uh, uh, okay, so basically this, uh, Uh, okay, so it's not so surprising, maybe, uh, because non-interacting phonons. Okay, and then, of course, we need uh, some... Okay, and then you can have two different uh, ways of scattering phonons. One is you can put in impurities, and they, they, they would scatter phonons, so put in impurities. Or include enharmonic, uh, enharmonicity. Right, so this would, uh, I mean, both of this, like this would, this is means phonon, phonon interactions, and this is like phonons get scattered by uh, static impurities or whatever. Okay, so, uh, okay, so, uh, so impurities means uh, one, like one uh, well studied uh, uh, model is to, uh, is, uh, is just to make the masses, uh, take a harmonic chain and uh, make the masses random or the spring constants random, okay? So that's uh, like putting some disorder in the system. So, uh, okay, so, uh, so example is like harmonic chain with, let's say, mass disorder. 
Okay, so instead of equal masses of uh, like particles, you just put let's say m1, m2 randomly. Okay, two different masses uh, distributed randomly, uh, and uh, so it's still harmonic, and but there's uh, randomness. Okay, and then uh, uh, you can put anharmonicity, which means uh, you change the uh, interaction potential. Uh, you could change this or you could change that. Okay, so uh, I mean uh, make. Okay, so this result is true even for, uh, so you could put some here, let's say k naught r square root 2. So even if you put uh, on-site potential and uh, interparticle potential, both of which are quad quadratic, then this results are still true. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so anharmonicity means you could, uh, I mean, either make this, uh, uh, okay, so either, either v or u r, is uh, like non has uh, maybe uh, k by two r square, and then you include extra terms. Okay, maybe this is not good notation. Huh. Uh, Okay, so uh, yeah, you could uh, take a given realization of uh, masses, do the experiment, and of course, uh, okay, so, I mean, uh, you might expect that if it's, your system is long, uh, big enough, then it's possible that, uh, I mean, if you take another realization of disorder, you might get the same, more or less the same answer, because there's some sort of averaging going on, right? But of course, you can do many realizations and see, uh, I mean, what, on average, what do you get? So you have to do one uh, given realization, you calculate steady, steady state properties, and then you can do an average over realizations. Right? Uh, but if it's a, a system with sort of self averages, then you expect that sample to sample fluctuations uh, should be small. But that's a question that you can ask. I mean, maybe in some cases it might be quite large. Okay, so uh, so in this case, you take a ordered crystal no disorder, and but you put in anharmonic terms, and then uh, you ask what happens. Okay. Okay, so uh, okay, so now both. I mean, uh, you can ask. So main question is, uh, do you get Fourier's law in any of these cases, right? Uh, and uh, okay, so uh, so let me just again state results. Okay, so uh, so f this is first. Okay, so in this case, uh, what you uh, I mean, uh, you can do a lot of computations. Uh, okay, no, I mean, so this was of course completely exact, right? This is a, a, like a completely exact calculation. Once you put in disorder, you can still do because it's still a, a harmonic system. You can still do many things uh, kind of analytically, and in fact, there are some uh, there are various exact results. So in the uh, so today and maybe tomorrow, I'll discuss uh, this pr problem. Like, uh, how do you approach uh, like this particular case uh, where harmonic system with mass diso uh, with uh, disorder? And in this case, uh, what you can show is that uh, what you find is uh, uh, you get uh, uh, so the first result is current. How does it depend on system size? And uh, so, I mean, normally you expect that if you take a wire and you connect it to heat baths. I mean, uh, how you connect at the boundary shouldn't matter so much, right? That's the normal expectation. If it's a large enough system, because, uh, yeah. Uh, these are all averages. I mean, uh, these are all, sorry, uh, these are all averages. I mean, average in the steady state, right, yeah. So even so, uh, maybe sometimes I won't put average, but uh, whenever I'm talking of like Fourier's law, I should mean average uh, over steady state. And in this case, you can even put another average over uh, disorder. Okay. Now, uh, so normally you expect that. Uh, I mean, 
uh, what kind of boundary conditions you put uh, shouldn't affect the results at uh, if the system is very long. Okay. But in these disordered uh, systems, uh, uh, in harmonic systems, you find that boundary conditions are very important. And uh, what you can show is that uh, uh, depending on boundary conditions, you can get something like uh, n to the power 3 by 2. This is for fixed boundary condition. So yesterday I discussed uh, this uh, idea of fixed boundary condition and free boundary condition. And you get 1 by n to the power half for free boundary conditions. OK, so these results can be understood very uh, neatly. And I'll uh, describe uh, like uh, how do you understand. And these are kind of rigorous uh, r results. Okay. So for a disordered harmonic chain, whatever you do, you don't uh, get uh, Fourier's law. Okay, and the other point is that this is uh, in uh, uh, in the absence of a on-site uh, of a pinning potential. Okay, so this is just uh, without pinning. Uh, if you put pinning, means at every time uh, site you have uh, uh, springs, then uh, you get something. Uh, you, uh, okay, so okay, so maybe it's not very. Really. Uh, so for v not equal to zero, which means you have a disordered harmonic chain, but with pinning then you find that the current uh, goes exponentially with system size. Okay, so into N. Okay, and this is like an insulator. Okay, so uh, what we'll see is that uh, if you have disordered harmonic uh, systems, you have things like localization and uh, so on. Uh, and then because of localization, I mean, most states can't carry current and you get, uh, you get an insulator. Okay. So for a pinned system, you get insulator. For unpinned system, you still get some power law dependence of the current. OK, so this is for uh, har disordered harmonic chains. And then what are the results for anharmonicity? For? Yeah. Yeah, for this, is, this result is independent of boundary conditions, right here. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, so okay, so this is uh, okay, so this is a, uh, disordered harmonic change, yeah. No, original means what? That, that uh, I mean, uh, okay, original means what? <laughs> this is uh, I mean, I'm free to choose what I want to put, right? I mean. Uh, inverse square potential, no. No, right, yeah, so I can put either, so this of term I definitely need, right, because otherwise these are uncoupled oscillators. So this term I nef definitely need. But uh, after putting this as harmonic, I can either put this to zero or not put it to zero. Right, I have a choice. So I'm saying the, this makes a difference. If it's pinned, it's, uh, you get some result. If it's unpinned, it, you get a different result. Yeah. Pinning uh, potential, see, even without pinning, if you, so, OK, maybe I'll, I'll explain this later. But basically, you have a uh, harmonic chain. Right? And uh, these are masses. Uh, these masses are random, m1, m2, and so on. Okay, and then you can uh, calculate the normal modes of the system, right? If you compute the normal modes, you'll find uh, whether it's pinned or no, uh, unpinned. I mean, almost all states are. Uh, so if you okay, so if there was no disorder, you can call, calculate the normal modes. They're just like plane waves, right? These are the normal modes of the system, and you have Q going from like n pi by l something. Uh, with different wavelengths, you have the plane wave. Those are the normal modes. Once you put disorder any finite uh, fraction of disorder, you'll find that uh, almost all states are localized in one dimension. Okay, This is irrespective of whether you have pinning or unpinned. But the difference with pin, uh, pinning is that uh, if you have unpinned, then you find that very low, uh, the long wavelength modes, they are still uh, extended. Okay, So that's the big difference, that the, uh, with pinning, there are no long wavelength modes, and uh, everything is localized. Without pinning, uh, the long wavelength modes are still extended, and they can carry, carry current. Right? So that's what uh, we'll go through this in detail later. But that's the idea. Uh, all kind of 
Yeah, I mean pretty much, uh, yeah. Oh, so, okay, so, uh, so like someone asked, I mean, uh, is this for a fixed disorder or not, right? So you have, uh, you can put a fixed uh, disorder realization, like fix the masses, and then you'll uh, get some steady state uh, value, right? So that's the steady state average. And then, of course, you can keep changing your randomness. Uh, you can take different random realizations and you can do an average over that, right? So that's the disorder average. So that's, those are the two averages. <laughs> okay, so, uh, no, but it can't go, <laughs> I know that it can't go, because this uh, is, uh, you have already, uh, this uh, the limits are not interchangeable. Okay, you're saying, okay, there, maybe there's something which depends on disorder, right? And you're saying if you take disorder going to zero, this should go to that, but that's hard to get, and because this, you have already taken some asymptotic limits and so on. I mean, you can't just go from this to this. Uh, okay, so um, okay, so this is the first case, and then you can ask what happens uh, with anharmonicity. <coughs> okay, so uh, okay, so that this is uh, sort of uh, I mean one uh, you can put anharmonicity in various ways. This is one of the popular choices uh, that you can make. And this is, uh, if you put a potential like this, and uh, okay, so, uh, okay, so possible models are, okay, so there are two very well studied models. Uh, so model one is, uh, B is zero, uh, UR is equal to, Okay, so uh, I mean, uh, these coefficients uh, k3, k4, but uh, historically these are uh, called, put as alpha r cubed by 3 plus beta r4 by 4. Okay, so this is one model, and this is a famous model. It's called uh, Fermi Pasta Ulam uh, chain. Okay, and uh, nowadays sometimes people write uh, T here. Uh, so this model is uh, Fermi, Pasta, Ulam, they, I mean, they investigated, but there was a fourth person here called, uh, I think, uh, Singhao, um, and maybe Mary, Mary Singhao, is it? Okay. And so, I mean, she, she's the person who did all the simulations, okay. But uh, somehow that time people thought that, okay, that's some size, and uh, maybe not so important. And so she didn't get the name, but uh, nowadays many people put, uh, like, write it as FPUT model. Okay, so uh, so they investigated for, of course, for very different reasons. They were trying to test why statistical physics works and uh, just equilibrium statistical physics, why does it work? And uh, But uh, this is, of course, the reason they chose it uh, because it's the simplest nonlinear system you can think of, right? That's why you choose this model. And when you study heat conduction, again, this is the simplest thing you can think of, so you just study this model. Okay. So we just take this potential and then, uh, okay, so now once you take this, you, can, uh, you cannot do much uh, analytically. Uh, they, I mean, it's difficult uh, to do any uh, exact calculations. And uh, so in uh, 1997, uh, uh, this set of people, Lepri, Levy, Politi, They did a set of, uh, like, you just do simulations, right? That's the easiest thing to do. Uh, you uh, take those equations, and then it's easy to do a, a Langeva dynamic uh, simulations with this. And you can, in your simulations, you can calculate, uh, you can take a system size, calculate the current, uh, take a different system size, calculate the current, and so on, and see what you get, right? So what they found was that, uh, I mean, if you plot J versus uh, N, then uh, you don't get, uh, or let's say you, compute j times n, right? So, I mean, uh, so Fourier's law says j kappa delta t by n. So if you multiply j times n and uh, divide by delta t, that should give you the conductivity, right? And as you, for small systems, of course, uh, you might get some funny thing, but as you take larger and larger n, uh, this kappa should become independent of system size, right? So let's say you plot this kappa versus n. Okay, so you just measure the conductivity by for different system sizes and see what you get. 
And what they found is that, uh, I mean, they did simulations maybe for uh, 1,000 particles in 1997, and uh, so a different size, uh, maximum 1,000, and then they found that it just keeps increasing. Okay, so the, and uh, they found some number, like uh, what they said was it's like 0.4 maybe. Okay, so this was the uh, surprising result that even with the, if you ever take an anharmonic chain and compute the current, you don't get a finite conductivity. The uh, this seems to diverge with system size, right? Okay, so uh, so there have been large number of simulations since then, and uh, for all. Uh, so what are the other models you can study? Uh, so uh, another very popular model is uh, it's a hard particle gas. It's like again the I mean the another simple model is ideal gas, right? Uh, and uh, ideal gas, uh, you can just study what happens, heat conduction. So ideal gas in, uh, in some sense like the harmonic chain, okay? So if you take equal mass particles and uh, the dynamics is that when they collide, they just elastically collide, then this is a sort of trivial dynamics in the sense that when the two particles collide, they just exchange their velocities, okay? So it's like they just go through each other. So it's almost like a non-interacting system similar to the harmonic chain, okay? And in this model, you can again show that the current is independent of system size and uh, the co temperature is completely flat, okay? So now you can make it kind of interacting by uh, doing a small modification, which is like you take uh, particles of uh, alternate masses, Okay, these are point particles. I'm putting a circle, but these are all point particles. But their masses are m1, m2, m1, m2. This is not disordered. It's just uh, alternate masses. Okay, so this is called uh, alternate mass. Hard particle gas. Okay, so uh, this is, uh, I mean, once you put the, make the masses different, then it's when they collide, it's a non-trivial dynamics, right? I mean, you have energy conservation, momentum conservation, and the incoming momentum will change to in a non-trivial way. Okay, and you can so show that this, uh, and at least you can test that this has good ergodicity properties and equilibration properties. And uh, this is also people have done large number of simulations in such models, okay. And again, you find a similar, let like, the conductivity diverges uh, some power. Uh, okay, then, okay, so these are uh, simulation results. And then uh, the question is, uh, do we, how, uh, do we understand these uh, results? Uh, where did it go? Okay, so uh, 
So basically the idea is that, okay, and then there are also people have done on Leonard Jones cache systems and so on. Uh, but basically results from simulation Uh, basically, uh, what people find is that uh, the current uh, scales as 1 by n to the power uh, okay, so the, uh, and this alpha is uh, greater than 0. Okay, so if uh, Fourier's law was true, then alpha should be zero and the conductivity should be independent of system size, but you get some alpha greater than zero. And uh, in uh, many simulations, right, uh, I mean, people find some number close to one third. Okay, this alpha is close to one third. Okay, and the other thing that was observed in simulations was also the temperature profile. Uh, if you plot uh, temperature uh, as a function of space, then these are the end temperatures. And typically you find that uh, uh, like it, okay. So uh, this is T left and this is T right. And in between you find this uh, very uh, nonlinear profile. Okay. Even when the temperature differences are very small, you find this highly nonlinear temperature profile, okay. So these are the two signatures of, uh, I mean, that you find in the, all these uh, systems. And I should say this is, uh, all these are for uh, V equal to zero. So no pinning and uh, U is uh, nonlinear. Huh? Uh, Okay, yeah, maybe <laughs> that's uh, better, yeah. So, okay, so it's usually a quadratic, okay, I mean, non okay, but uh, usually non-linear, uh, okay, when I say non-linear, I usually mean higher than quadratic, which is <laughs> non-quadratic, okay, because I, I don't know, you can't use this in a paper, I think, for non-quadratic. Okay, uh, yeah, so that's an important point. Non-linear always means, uh, in terms of equations of motion, right? Equations of motions are linear when you have quadratic potential. So when I say nonlinear, I really mean the forces are nonlinear. Uh, okay, so you non quadratic, then it's uh, this, okay. Uh, okay, then the other result is that uh, if uh, V is non zero, And uh, uh, and uh, it's anharmonic. Okay, and you put uh, this uh, nonlinearity either in V or uh, and nonlinear, either in V or uh, 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 U. Then you find uh, actually that Fourier's law is true. Okay. And one, uh, again, one simple example is what is known as the phi four model, where uh, V is, let's say, uh, you just put something like, uh, and U is, okay, so interaction is quadratic, but you have on-site quartic term at every site, okay. So this makes, uh, in this case, you get Fourier's law, okay? So if you have pinning and nonlinearity, then you get Fourier's law, okay? So now, the, what is the big difference between these two models, the, this model and this model, is basically that uh, uh, once you have pinning, then you don't have momentum conservation in the system, okay? So, to, I mean, total momentum is not conserved, so that's, uh, uh, so you have different conservation laws, and this makes a big difference, okay? Okay, so now, uh, 
so this is the uh, picture that we have uh, for uh, harmonic systems uh, with disorder. You have some results. You don't get Fourier's law. For anharmonic systems, systems without pinning, uh, you find uh, this kind of uh, non-Fourier behavior. And this is what I'll call as, this is called anomalous transport, heat transport, right? When uh, you don't get Fourier's law and uh, so this is anomalous uh, heat transport. And uh, so this case I won't discuss, uh, the case where you have an on-site potential, I'll stick to systems without on-site potential because that's the more physically relevant situation when you don't have an on-site potential. So we'll just uh, stick to this case. And uh, so this is uh, called uh, anomalous heat transport. Yeah, V not equal to zero, and you have to have either U or V nonlinear. Yeah, either of them, right here. Yeah. Okay, now, uh, okay, so right now I'm just giving you an overview, and then I'll go through the like various uh, parts in more detail. Uh, so uh, now, this anomalous heat transport in this anharmonic systems, how do you understand this? And uh, so there are two different ways uh, like th that some understanding has been achieved. And uh, I'm going to talk about this in the next uh, uh, few lectures. So, Okay, so the first approach is uh, using something called fluctuating hydrodynamics. Okay, so here the idea is, uh, I mean, you have this system of interacting particles. Now, uh, in hydrodynamics, what you do is you uh, you look at a you take a coarse grained uh, uh, view and ask what are the conserved quantities. Okay, so if you don't have the pinning potential, then the conserved quantities are energy, momentum, and number of particles. Right, there are three conservation laws. Okay, and then uh, you write something like uh, basically uh, the hydrodynamic equations. Uh, so this is like writing Navier-Stokes equation for a one-dimensional fluid. Uh, but okay, you have to write it a bit carefully, and uh, then you put in some noise also to describe equilibrium fluctuations. Okay. So uh, the idea of uh, fluctuating hydrodynamics is to understand anomalous transport, not in this non-equilibrium setup, but in a equilibrium setup where you ask like, uh, I mean, how do perturbations pro propagate? Okay. So basically, using this formalism, we'll, uh, we'll try to compute uh, correlation functions in equilibrium and see if we see these features of uh, anomalous transport in these quantities. Okay. So that's one approach. And the second approach is uh, uh, like looking at exactly solved models. Okay, so fluctuating hydrodynamics is basically uh, uh, look at, so initially I said there are these two ways of looking at anomalous transport. One is uh, open system, which is uh, what I told here, and but you can also look at closed system description where you either like take a system, put a heat pulse and see how it spreads, or you look at correlation functions, right? So that's something you can understand within the framework of fluctuating hydrodynamics. And this exactly solvable models are uh, simple models where uh, you can uh, compute things exactly somehow. And then you can test all these things, both in the open and closed system framework, OK? So this kind of models are uh, so that, uh, I mean, uh, these are basically stochastic models, OK? And uh, uh, stochastic models which uh, satisfy the same conservation laws, OK? So the important. A uh, thing that we understand from hydrodynamics is that the conservation laws is what makes, uh, gives rise to anomalous transport. And so it's good to have some exactly solvable models where you uh, keep the same, uh, somehow uh, preserve the conservation laws, but write some simple dynamics. Okay. So, for example, one uh, model, uh, it's called the uh, momentum exchange model. So you take a harmonic chain, which is of course completely integrable and has, as we saw, has trivial uh, results. 
but uh, uh, so it has its uh, some Hamiltonian dynamics. But then you add some stochastic part where you let's say you exchange uh, uh, momentum between nearest neighbor particles with at some rate. Okay. So when you do that, uh, if you just exchange randomly momentum between particles. Uh, then of course momentum is conserved, energy is conserved, and number of particles is conserved, right? But you break down, I mean, uh, but all the other conservation laws of the harmonic chain are gone. Okay, so it just has these three conservations now. And uh, because it's a harmonic chain and with some simple stochastic dynamics, you can actually solve it uh, exactly, okay? Uh, so solve means you can at least find some quantities and uh, uh, you can uh, understand anomalous transport. So in this case, uh, so the model I'll describe is uh, called uh, harmonic chain. Okay, so this uh, fluctuating dynamic, hydrodynamics, it, uh, I mean, this is a lot of work uh, due to uh, Herbert Spohn. Uh, but also, And this model was uh, proposed first by, I think, uh, Basile. These are, uh, this is some uh, like French uh, group of people, Basile. Uh, so, uh, okay, so uh, this is the plan. So what I'll try to do is, uh, in the uh, lectures, what I'll try to do is first, give some idea of how this harmonic, disordered harmonic systems are tackled, uh, where you can do a lot of uh, like things uh, analytically. And uh, then I will probably talk about uh, this uh, uh, this model with momentum exchange where uh, and give an outline of how uh, things can be computed exactly. And then in the last lecture, I will describe this uh, formalism of fluctuating hydrodynamics. Uh, so for this case, you can do both the open and closed system, okay? Uh, and this one you can do only uh, closed system. Okay, so, uh, okay, so any questions? Oh, right, yes. Uh, yeah, so I mean, uh, there are uh, uh, some examples of nonlinear systems where, uh, which uh, are like which are integrable, uh, and then of course you still have ballistic transport. Okay, so if you, uh, I mean, so that, that's a very special class. So I'll assume that I'm not taking uh, those things. So if you do simulations in two dimensions, right? Yeah. Uh, okay, no, so uh, two dimensions also it's supposed to be anomalous. Uh, there's a logarithmic divergence. Power law, right, yeah. Um, right, yeah. So two dimensions, there's much less work, but at least uh, from this, uh, if you do fluctuate hydrodynamics or uh, just uh, is, is there some simulation results, you still seem to get a logarithmic divergence. Uh, okay, so uh, kinetic theory in one dimension certainly gives you a, a divergence, uh, but 2D, I don't know. I haven't seen a kinetic theory calculation. Uh, okay, so the other thing I just want to say is that uh, from hydrodynamics, uh, there's a, uh, uh, what one of the predictions is that this uh, alpha, uh, which is the exponent uh, which uh, tells you how the thermal conductivity diverges is uh, sort of universal. It's, I mean, uh, one third for a large class of system. There's a very special class 
Uh, so I'll just right now I'll just say for most systems. And uh, it's half uh, for a special class of choice. Okay, so whether you take alternate mass, hard particle gas, or FPU, or Leonard Jones, you're supposed to get uh, one third, okay? And uh, there's some special conditions like uh, even potential, pressure zero, and so on, where you get uh, half. Okay, uh, so by the way, there's a, and maybe I gave you some references. So uh, uh, one of them was this uh, advances in physics. Uh, that's a review article, uh, and uh, there you find a lot of this stuff. Uh, and then I gave uh, lecture notes in physics. This is like 2008. Okay, so it's a bit old, but a lot of the uh, definitions and things are worked out carefully, so you can. Uh, look at uh, so then this lecture notes in physics. Uh, so this uh, this is a like collection of lot of articles on uh, heat transport in low dimensional systems, and uh, uh, so this has uh, like uh, uh, the various things like it has these fluctuating dynamics in one chapter and the uh, exactly solvable models in another chapter, and then there's a chapter on kinetic theory and so on, okay. So all the various approaches in uh, for uh, this low dimensional transport are uh, described in this uh, collection. Okay. This is 2016. Uh, and uh, then uh, for, uh, <coughs> so I'll talk about this uh, uh, disordered harmonic uh, systems. Uh, so this, I, uh, I, I gave some lectures in uh, in a school in Leuven, and these are there published in this uh, Physica A, uh, which also I uh, yesterday gave the full reference. So this is this, this will be useful for uh, that part of the talk, uh, and uh, then finally one more reference that uh, you might want to look at is uh, so there's an old paper by. Uh, Uh, it's called uh, Fourier's Law. Uh, okay, it's called Fourier's Law, a theorist's uh, challenge. Okay, so basically this was, uh, this is in 2000. Uh, I mean, uh, so it uh, gives some bit of history and also then poses the problem in a very, uh, clear way, uh, and uh, so this is a nice article to read about. Uh, it also tells you about linear response theory and so on. Okay, so this is, uh, and uh, this paper actually, it, uh, it, uh, this challenge uh, was like, it says that if you solve this problem, if you can show somehow that you Fourier's law de derived from microscopics, uh, then you get a bottle of very good wine, okay. So, I mean, that was 2000 and still so far no one has really done this. So it's an open problem, maybe some of you can uh, do this. Okay, so now we uh, uh, start with uh, harmonic systems.
without breaking uh, no so the challenge was to prove fourier's law for any system any system yeah even 3d i mean if you can prove it really yeah, uh, yeah but experiment that's not a proof right and okay maybe i should also say about experiments okay so like uh, uh, the, uh, are there any experiments that uh, to test this. I mean, uh, there are very few experiments. Uh, the closest system you can get to one-dimensional systems are maybe uh, nanotubes and nanowires, right? So there have been like uh, I think two, three experiments on nanotubes, uh, which have reported that uh, the, as you increase system size, the conductivity diverges. Okay. So there's one recent paper in 2016, uh, some PRL, uh, where they actually take us uh, like a suspended nanotube. Okay, so you somehow uh, take a long nanotube, and they actually made a like millimeter long nanotube. Okay, so that's very hard. I mean, but you take a, a long nanotube and then uh, measure the conductivity for different system sizes, and they get this sort of a divergence. Okay, so uh, nanotubes. I mean, the, right now the theory doesn't really say anything about nanotubes, right? Because these models are really simple. I mean, these are scalar variables at every site, and so it doesn't. Uh, but there are some simulations on. If you take a realistic uh, uh, nanotube potential and uh, then compute, the, you can do a simulation, and there the results are similar. Okay, you seem to get a diverging thermal conductivity. Yeah, I mean including everything, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the simulations, right? Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, okay, so let's go to harmonic systems. And uh, here, uh, like I said, you can do many things exactly. And uh, so, let's. Uh, why is it uh, why is it easy to do, uh, get exact results? Is okay. So let's look at the equations of motion. Uh, so we have let's say m. Okay, so I'll uh, consider a uh, system like this. Okay, so uh, let's say all the uh, springs are k, uh, but at the boundary I put a, a different spring constant. Okay, this is just to so that I can play around with boundary conditions and so on. Okay, so this is k prime. So if you write the equations, it should look like uh, k prime. Okay, so we have this set of uh, linear equations, uh, and uh, so here uh, the disorder, I mean, uh, you could do it in various ways. You could have made the spring constants random, but uh, I'm just uh, choosing masses uh, uh, different so that I can, if I want, I can put them uh, random, right? So that's the model. 
Okay, so now uh, uh, what I want to calculate is uh, that this system, uh, finally I want to compute things like uh, the temperature, which is, I said, uh, uh, mi and uh, the current G, uh, which is uh, something like uh, Right, so this is the, okay, there's a spring constant K. So this is the force from the IE minus particle on the IEth particle into velocity, right? that's the current. And I can, if I want, uh, I know that this is also equal to the uh, current flowing from the uh, heat paths, which was uh, gamma uh, V1 So I, I can compute either this object or this object. Both of them should give me the current in the steady state. Okay, so uh, if we look at these objects, I mean, so these are just uh, averages of uh, quadratic quantities. And if I have a, uh, uh, if I have a linear dynamics, uh, then how do I compute this, right? So, uh, so what is the simplest way I can do this? Okay, so let's say if I, let's think of a simpler problem. Uh, I just have a single particle, mv dot equals to uh, single particle in a, a potential well. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so how do I compute uh, if I want some uh, like uh, x dot squ uh, square average or uh, x square average? So these are the kind of things I'm interested in computing, right? How would I compute this in the steady state? Equipartition, but uh, if you just want to calculate it from first principles, I mean, how do you do it? Huh? Okay, Fourier transform is one way. Uh, any other way? Uh, okay. Uh, Right, yeah, you can try to write equations for, let's say, correlation functions. Uh, okay, so you can uh, try to write equations of motion for these objects. And uh, if it's a qu uh, uh, quadratic system, this uh, correlation functions will form a closed set, okay. And then you can try to solve that uh, thing. Okay, so that's uh, one way. And then the other thing you can do is uh, basically, uh, so th there are only three possible correlations, right, with X and P, the two-point correlation. So you can, uh, you have, you can write some equations for this, and this will form a closed set of equations, and then you can uh, find the steady-state solution. Okay, then uh, the other thing you can do is write a Fokker-Planck equation. Okay, so, and uh, then find the steady-state solution of that uh, Fokker-Planck equation. Okay, so in this case, the uh, Fokker-Planck equation is, uh, yesterday we discussed in the tutorial, uh, is uh, so this is a system with uh, x, p, e, and t, and uh, this has it uh, like part of the, it just comes from Hamiltonian dynamics. So that is uh, minus del del. Okay, so this is just comes from Hamiltonian dynamics. Uh, so to, I mean, so this is, you can equivalently write it as x dot equals to p by m and p dot equals to minus. Right. So this is the bath and this is just Hamiltonian dynamics. So from the Hamiltonian dynamics, you just get some uh, 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 equation, which is the Liouville equation basically. And from the bath, uh, you basically get plus 
del del p of <coughs> Okay, so uh, this again is just the drift part, so gamma P by M, and this comes from the diffusion. Okay, so diffusion constant, this is diffusion in momentum space. So P dot equal to eta would just give you an uh, equation like that, right? It's, uh, diffusion in momentum space. So this is the diffusion constant and this. Okay, so if you have this, then it's easy to check that, uh, I mean, e to the power minus beta H. So H is here, what? H is just P square by 2M plus half AX square, right? So it's easy to check that this uh, is a steady state solution of this equation, okay? So if you plug it in here, I mean, this uh, this is, uh, I mean, this part is just, uh, it's the Poisson bracket of rho and uh, H and P. So this part, of course, vanishes trivially. And this part, uh, basically, this involves uh, um, only the momentum part, and momentum part is just e to the power minus beta p square by 2m. So if you plug it in, this part uh, vanishes, right? So this is obviously a steady state solution of this equation. Okay, so if you know the steady state solution, of course, then you can compute uh, x square and p square average, so that's uh, easy to do. Okay, and uh, so, the, yeah, so this is one way you can uh, cr try to compute these things. Uh, and the uh, other way is, uh, which is a more uh, sort of maybe straightforward way, is to just take Fourier transforms, right? like some of you said. So Fourier transform means so you just do Fourier transforms in time. So you just take xt is equal to uh, and you plug it in there and then you get minus m omega square Okay. Okay. So now uh, this is you can just solve this equation, and uh, so x tilde omega is I'll call this uh, function g omega of uh, eta tilde omega. So you can write the solution. Uh, for the position in terms of the noise, right? Where uh, this g of omega, it's like a Green's function, is basically one over Okay, so this is the solution in Fourier A. Uh, and now we just uh, 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 okay, so uh, we have to compute this x dot square and uh, okay, so if we want to calculate uh, x dot square average, uh, then uh, okay, first let's say just calculate x square average. Uh, then we take this and uh, so we write uh, d of omega, d of omega prime. So I'll just do this calculation because uh, afterwards we'll have to do the same thing for a more complicated situation. So right now just let's understand the, how it works. So this gives uh, to the power i omega t i minus one. And then uh, g of omega, Right, this is uh, what we get if we just plug in that solution. And now we need to know this. Uh, so what is this? Noise, noise. Huh? 
Okay, so maybe people already know this, so I won't uh, do the derivation, but uh, this you can do as a homework if you have not done it. So given that this is equal to 2 gamma kvt, so you should verify that uh, eta prime is equal to Okay, so this is what you get. Okay, so you should just verify that this is true. Okay, so then we put uh, eta omega. This becomes delta omega plus omega prime. One of the integrals goes, and since omega plus omega prime is zero, so the time integral, the time vanishes, and you just get uh, equals to d omega g <coughs> omega uh, mod square, and then there's this uh, gamma k b t by pi. <laughs> okay, now of course g of omega is this object and uh, then uh, then you have to do some integral, right? You can do it by contour integral or whatever. Uh, and But finally, what do you get? Okay, I won't do the integral, but the uh, answer is? Yeah, so answer you'll uh, get uh, basically what you expect, k b t by k. Okay, so this was, uh, I mean, so this is how it works. I mean, you can, in principle, just uh, do it and uh, get anything. And then if you go, similarly, you can do x dot square. Uh, x dot square will involve basically some extra omega square here, right? And again, you can do the integral and you'll find that this is equal to uh, kvt by m. Right, okay, so this is something you should, if you have not done it, just do it. <coughs> okay, so this is how, uh, uh, so there are these two ways of doing it, and you can uh, either do uh, do either approach. Okay. <coughs> okay. So now, uh, eight minutes. Okay. So uh, <coughs> okay. So now we do the same thing out here, right? So we have given this equation. We can do either either approach. We can either write the Fokker Planck and then uh, try to uh, find the steady state. Okay, so uh, <coughs> okay for Okay, so uh, okay, so now of course uh, we the uh, I mean, can we say actually anything about the non-equilibrium full steady state? Like in equilibrium, we know it's zero to the minus beta h. In non-equilibrium, I mean, uh, uh, is it possible to find it? <coughs> okay, so first of all, I mean, uh, you can write the Fokker-Planck equation immediately. Uh, so this is now uh, you have uh, x1 to xn and p1 to pn. <clears throat> right, uh, and uh, this will have uh, so there's some part which is just the uh, the Hamiltonian dynamics. So so that's just the Liouville part. <coughs> okay, so it's just Poisson bracket. So is it HP or PH? Uh, HP, right? Okay. So this is just the Poisson bracket, and then the heat bath are there, right? So you just uh, so we, for one heat bath we got that. And you, know, you just have to add one extra heat bath, right? So then this is easy to do. So we basically have uh, del del <coughs> p1 uh, Okay, so these are the two at uh, the particle one uh, and particle n have these extra terms and th there's a different temperature, right, at the two ends. 
Okay, so first, I mean, uh, one thing you can verify, this was uh, to Tom's question yesterday, like if you put TL equals to TR, uh, then you can see that uh, this, of course, uh, then, and you ask, is, uh, is this still a solution, right? So then you can check that this, of course, vanishes, and uh, this one also will vanish, right? Because it only, only involves e to the power minus beta P1 square by two, so it will clearly vanish, and this also vanishes. So uh, definitely for TL equal to TR uh, equals to T, let's say. So this is still the, is uh, still a uh, steady state solution, is still. Okay, and you can actually show that uh, this is a unique solution in the sense if you start from arbitrary initial conditions, it will converge to this uh, solution. Okay, so that's a bit uh, more difficult to show. Uh, okay, so this is uh, if they're equal. Now, if you put uh, TL not equal to TR, then of course it looks very hard. Okay, so this statement that it goes to this is true, even if you have anharmonic uh, things, whatever you do, this is still true. Okay, but now let's stick to the harmonic case and ask if TL, uh, uh, is not equal to TR, then what can you say about the steady state, okay? So one thing we know is that since the dynamics is linear, uh, we know that the steady state has to be a Gaussian, okay? So this was of course a uh, Gaussian, right? It uh, in, involves just quadratic terms in the Hamiltonian. Uh, but even in the non-equilibrium case, you expect that it has to be a Gaussian, okay? So, uh, <clears throat> But uh, now the Gaussian will have uh, not just, uh, it will have all sorts of terms, okay? So basically, uh, uh, so the non equilibrium steady state, which is the solution of this equation, uh, so it should satisfy del T P equals to zero. Uh, okay, so, uh, so, Uh, it has to be Gaussian, which means, okay, so what, uh, I mean, so what's the most general Gaussian you can write for a system like this? So let's say we define uh, variables Q, uh, Q1 to Q2n, uh, which is equal to X1, X2 to Xn, and P1 to Pn. <coughs> then the, uh, then you can basically say that uh, the most general Gaussian you can write is uh, something like, uh, P of <clears throat> okay, so uh, divided by some normalization. Okay, so this is, uh, right, I mean, it has to be a Gaussian, it has to be of this form. Okay, and then you can ask what are these coefficients Aij. So, uh, so it turns out that what you can uh, do is you can show that this Aij uh, satisfies some li a linear equation. Okay, uh, so, uh, so I won't uh, go through this, but you can basically show that, uh, <coughs> or let's say you define uh, this correlation matrix Aij equals to, Uh, and uh, so, uh, okay, so let me, I don't know if I can give the idea. Okay, so I'm just thinking if I can uh, illustrate it through this uh, one particle example. Oh, okay. Okay, so maybe uh, I'll do this uh, the next time, but basic idea is that, uh, so what this is what was done in uh, this paper by Ryder, Lieb, and Lebowitz. So they, uh, so like I said, they computed this distribution exactly, and what they, their approach was to basically you can show that this C, it satisfies some linear equation like, uh, uh, okay, so maybe B, uh, C plus C, B, Okay, so 
this uh, C is th this unknowns, uh, which are uh, like uh, this is each IJ goes from 1 to 2N. So this is some uh, uh, big matrix. And this B and uh, B is another N, 2N cross 2N matrix, which is known. Okay, So it's just known in terms of the spring constants and masses. Uh, and similarly this. And D is again some uh, 2N cross 2N matrix, which depends on temperature and so on. Okay. So this is uh, basically a linear equation. Uh, and then in principle, you can solve. It's obviously very hard. But for the case, uh, uh, all masses equal, uh, you can uh, exact solution. Or this uh, matrix C. OK, so this is what was done in this uh, RLL paper. And then, of course, you can, once you know the, uh, this uh, matrix, you know everything, right? Because uh, uh, th th that gives you, the, uh, I mean, these correlations are what you finally, uh, the current, temperature, everything depends on these correlations, right? So if you know this, you know everything exactly. OK, so this is the approach used in this paper. Uh, uh, and uh, maybe I'll just, in the next class, I'll just explain roughly how this comes about, OK? It's because this is also important when we uh, when we do this momentum exchange model. So okay, you'll get similar equations uh, for the momentum exchange model. OK, so <laughs> this is one approach. But the simpler, I mean, obviously, uh, OK, uh, like here we saw that doing this uh, just Fourier transforms uh, is a very straightforward way, right? So that's another approach that one can do. And what we'll see is that uh, doing this Fourier transform uh, approach is uh, it's uh, it's uh, much more straightforward, and also it's more general that uh, you can make the masses random, and you still get some explicit uh, uh, results. And uh, also, physic it gives you a lot of physical intuition of what's going on. Okay, so basically, we'll uh, use this Fourier transform approach, and uh, for uh, things like current and temperature, we'll get some expression like this. Okay, so it will be just, just some integral expression, and uh, in fact, the, I, I'll just write down what the current uh, will look like. So uh, I mean, if you just solve these equations using Fourier transforms and so on, finally what you'll find that the steady state uh, current okay, is given by some formula like this. Okay. So okay. So this is the final expression that you'll get, where this uh, t t this uh, t of omega. I mean, it's like a transmission coefficient of phonons, OK? So this is the temperature difference. The temperature appears only in this part because it's a non-interacting system. And then you have like, you are just, uh, you have a disordered chain. You're sending in phonons at some frequencies and how much is transmitted, OK? That's the final answer. And then, of course, we have to understand the nature of this uh, object. Like, how does transmission depend on if you put disorder? How does it depend on the things like that? And uh, so for the order chain, using this formula, we'll recover uh, whatever uh, this uh, exact paper uh, obtained for the order chain. But we can now also uh, go to the disorder chain and get a lot of uh, ex uh, results. Uh, in particular, okay, it's gone now, this uh, n dependence, 1 by square root of n and 1 by into the word 3 by 2. So all these, those, those things will follow basically from this uh, formula. OK, so in the next class, uh, maybe I'll briefly say how do you get this equation, and then I'll go on to derive this equation, and then derive some of the consequences of this equation for various uh, particular cases. OK, so any questions? No. OK, so we go for lunch.